Hello, and welcome to Flying Failures, where we'll be looking at the Supermarine Scimitar. The Supermarine Scimitar was the product of a lengthy development to create a brand new carrier-based fighter, which would help to maintain the Royal Navy's strategic role within the wider British Empire, being both a low-level strike aircraft, but also envisaged to administer Armageddon by way of carrying nuclear weapons, only for this machine, due to its exceptionally high accident rate, to be withdrawn after only 12 years in service, and working with only one operator during its whole career. The Supermarine Company had been founded originally in 1913 as the Pemberton Billing Firm of Woolston, Southampton, and began its career building early fighter aircraft during World War I to combat the menace of Zeppelins, the most notable being the Supermarine PB-31E Nighthawk, which, despite a planned flight endurance of 9 to 18 hours, failed to meet its promises and was scrapped after one prototype, while for the remainder of the conflict, and into the interwar years, it specialised in flying boat models such as the innocuous-sounding Supermarine N-1B Baby Fighter and the Supermarine Sea Lion, which attempted to compete in the 1919 Schneider Flying Boat Trophy, only for the aircraft to be damaged during a botched takeoff and later sink during recovery. Although the later Supermarine Sea Lion II saw better success, when it won the 1922 Schneider Trophy in Naples, attaining a top speed of 145 miles an hour. In 1936, Supermarine released its crowning achievement in the form of the Spitfire, a single-seat high-speed fighter aircraft that saw extensive use alongside the Hawker Hurricane in defending the UK from the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain, while also lending itself to numerous variants, including a dedicated carrier-based model called the Supermarine Seafire, which was launched in 1941, and differed from its land-based counterpart through a more lightweight design suited for the short takeoff and landing requirements of a carrier deck. The Seafire seeing extensive use during Operation Torch, where it supported the amphibious landing of Allied troops in North Africa against Rommel's Africa Corps, while also providing air support for the invasion of Sicily and the invasion of southern France during Operation Dragoon. The fighter proving its worth in spades as part of the British Pacific Fleet, where it went head-to-head -head with the fearsome Mitsubishi A6M0 and was used to defend surface vessels from kamikaze attacks. By the end of World War II, it was apparent to the Admiralty that a new breed of carrier-based fighter was needed in order to help defend Britain from a new threat poised by the communist factions of the Soviet Union, and thus it would be necessary for the fleet air arm to transition from the piston-powered sea fire to the emerging jet aviation. One of the more outlandish proposals, considered so as to save weight and cut down landing accidents, being to create an undercarriageless aircraft, which would have been launched by way of a special catapult and would land on a flexible rubber deck. Though despite the uncertainty of such a method, trials undertaken by the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, using a converted de Havilland Sea Vampire, proved that, regardless of early setbacks, the theory had practical merits. Though in the end, the Admiralty were less than impressed, and the scheme was abandoned in favour of something more traditional. Under specification N947, Supermarine answered the Admiralty's call for the lightweight undercarriageless fighter, but with the higher ranks rapidly losing interest in the flexible decks concept, the project, dubbed the Type 505, was modified to use a conventional retractable undercarriage, and thus became the Type 508, the proposal considering a straight-winged twin-engine jet with a butterfly or V-shaped tail, which was adopted to try and keep the tailplane clear of the jet exhaust and away from the deck, the Admiralty ordering three initial examples to be built, Although with the quickly changing specifications and requirements, each prototype differed from one another in various ways, with the second prototype having four 30mm Aden cannons with 160 rounds per gun installed, together with a larger tail cone in order to accommodate a proposed tail warning radar, and was thus redesignated the Type 529, while the third saw the largest alterations, including the fitting of swept wings, a conventional swept tail fin instead of the V-tail, and various other modifications such as blown flaps to reduce the aircraft's landing speed and was designated the Type 525. After a long and tedious development stage, the first prototype, the Type 508, undertook its maiden flight on August 31, 1951, from the RAF Boscombe Down Air Base in Wiltshire, followed in May 1952 by the aircraft carrying out initial carrier trials aboard audacious class aircraft carrier HMS Eagle, while the second prototype took to the skies on August 29, 1952, and the extensively modified Type 525 on April 27, 1954. The first two prototypes, with their straight-wing configuration, having a somewhat modest performance, being capable of attaining a top speed of 607 miles an hour, although both were rendered obsolete by the Type 525, which was able to attain a top speed of 647 miles an hour, and, with the fitting of blown flaps, was considered a far more optimised carrier fighter thanks to its improved low-speed performance. The aircraft was subsequently allocated to the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment, 
and was to undergo an intensive testing regimen following its public debut at that year's Farnborough Air Show in September 1954, but ultimately saw a very short career when on July 5, 1955, the aircraft was being tested for low-speed handling when, at 10,000 feet, the Type 525 entered an unrecoverable flat spin and plummeted to Earth. The test pilot, Lieutenant Commander T.A. Rickle, finding that due to a flaw in the design of the canopy, he was unable to jettison it swiftly prior to operating the ejector seat, meaning that, by the time he was eventually able to open the canopy and bail out, the fighter was far too low for his parachute to fully deploy, and Rickle tragically plunged to his death, while the aircraft itself slammed into the ground and was consumed by fire. Prior to the crash of the Type 525, however, its early tests had illustrated numerous endearing qualities in terms of its performance, including a reduction in its stalling speed, a reduced angle of attack, increased stability and control at low speeds, and more stable airflow over the wing's trailing edge. And thus, with the Admiralty considering that the prototype had proved its worth, an order was placed for 100 production units dubbed the Type 544 under specification N113, the change in designation being due to a last-minute demand by the Royal Navy to convert what was meant to be a lightweight fighter into a low-level strike aircraft that was capable of delivering nuclear weapons into combat, the role of a naval fighter being taken on by the upcoming de Havilland DH-110 Sea Vixen, although in the wake of the Type 525's crash, a non-naval land-based variant, dubbed the Type 526, was dropped when the Royal Air Force lost confidence in the design. Subsequently, the Type 544, like its predecessors, adopted Rolls-Royce Avon engines for propulsion and proved to be incredibly powerful units with a significant degree of excess thrust available. While Vickers made use of this with a flat blowing system that redirected part of the high-pressure air from the engines through thin slots ahead of the flaps, thus delaying the onset of boundary layer separation at low speeds and enabling the wing to continue flying in a stable manner at speeds much lower than normal, meaning that, in theory, the model would be far slower and safer to land on the diminutive flight decks of wartime-era aircraft carriers, the Type 544 prototype undertaking its maiden flight on January 19, 1956, followed by two additional prototypes, the Type 544 undergoing initial deck trials aboard HMS Ark Royal from April 1956, during which it was able to prove, with the power of the twin Avon engines, its ability to successfully take off unassisted from the carrier deck, with one pilot even illustrating its extremely strong performance when he took off with the parking brakes still applied. As with the earlier pre-production models, two initial Type 544 prototypes were used to help inform the development of the third, and in January 1957, the third example, which was more akin to what the final design envisaged, began trials on the Ark Royal, this aircraft differing through a strengthened body for its new low-level strike roll, and had various aerodynamic fixes applied, such as flared-out wingtips and wing fences, to try and counter pitch-up effects at high speed and altitude, a concern that had previously been noted on the likes of the Supermarine Swift while the tailplane was also changed from being dihedral to anhedral, although during the trials, the powered controls of the third prototype caused some consternation when it was noted that the high roll rates had the potential to cause structural damage, though this was dismissed by the strengthening introduced for the low-level roll. Christened the name Scimitar, the first production example flew on January 11, 1957, but was retained by Supermarine to undergo further trials and development while the following units were assigned by the Admiralty to the 700 Naval Air Squadron at HMS Peregrine, an experimental aircraft division, during August of the same year, evaluations continuing until late May 1958, much to the irritation of local residents in the nearby village of Ford, West Sussex, who found the noisy scimitar jets to be an unwelcome change to the previous slew of quieter models tested by 700 Squadron, such as the Supermarine Attacker and the Fairy Gannet, leading to a near-constant stream of complaints landing on the Navy's desk. Although regardless, the intensive flight testing program meant the model could be drafted into service with ease, being assigned to 803 Naval Air Squadron at RNAS Lossiemouth in June 1958. However, the Scimitar's reputation was quickly sullied, as on September 25, 1958, in front of the gathered press aboard HMS Victorious, Scimitar F Mark I X-Ray Delta 240, under the control of Commander John Russell, tumbled over the side of the carrier after the number one arrestor wire failed causing the plane to run at low speed over the side of the ship and into the Solent, the ever-present issue of the canopy refusing to open, meaning neither Commander Russell or the rescue diver from the Whirlwind Search and Rescue helicopter hovering above were able to release it prior to the fighter sinking, Russell eventually being able to open the canopy once the aircraft had slipped beneath the waves, but was unable to escape the cockpit itself due to him being tethered by the ejector seat leg straps at the dinghy lanyard, resulting in him drowning as he was dragged to the bottom with his aircraft. While blame on this high-profile incident couldn't be squarely put on the scimitar, 
the response of the Navy being to introduce improved underwater escape training, it was a major blow to the prestige of the fleet air arm. But regardless, the Scimitar was still pressed into service as the heaviest and most powerful aircraft ever to serve in the Royal Navy to that point. But this would lead to further issues following the publishing of the Defence White Paper of 1957, in which, due to cutbacks in defence spending and a reallocation of funds to ballistic missile projects, the Navy was unable to upgrade its fleet in the same manner as the equivalent US Navy by building larger aircraft carriers more suited to accommodating jet fighters, meaning the fleet air arm would have to make do with smaller vessels retrofitted with various features to try and improve deck operations, especially with the scimitar now being introduced. In light of there being no ability to modify or build new aircraft carriers that could easily handle the scimitar, a make-do-and-mend outlook was adopted based on the Admiralty's lack of investment, the design being amended to include a tail bumper so that the aircraft could be rested on its rear fuselage for takeoff, while the nose wheel hung high off the deck, the increased angle of attack meaning that less powerful catapults could be added to the Navy's small carriers that would bring the already heavy scimitar to flight speed with a full armament. Although this meant, in regular operation, the margin of error was very, very narrow, and even the most experienced pilots struggled to successfully manage the lumbering fighter. Losses rapidly mounted, with causes including hydraulic failures, in-flight fires, general loss of control, and, most prominently, landing accidents which occurred by the dozen, the sight of a scimitar tumbling over the side of a British aircraft carrier becoming a disturbingly frequent occurrence, with the overall consensus being that the Royal Navy was simply not experienced enough in operating such an advanced and heavy aircraft, combined with the budgetary cuts which meant that wartime carriers designed to take piston-powered fighters were completely ill-equipped to handle the scimitar. The result being that, of the 76 scimitars eventually produced, following the cancellation of the last 24 examples, no less than 39 were lost in a variety of accidents, representing an attrition rate of an alarming 51%, compounded further by the fact that, due to the aircraft's hasty conversion from a fighter to a low-level strike aircraft, and with the design not able to accommodate conversion for the use of two crew, meant the single pilot not only had to fly the aircraft, but was also in charge of lining up precision raids on targets a task which seriously overstretched the abilities of the naval crew. In the end, the Scimitar never fired a shot in anger during its short career, although it was instrumental in preventing a conflict in the Middle East during July 1961, when following increasingly hostile motions by Iraq towards the small neighbouring nation of Kuwait and the possibility of a full-scale invasion taking place, the British government deployed multiple vessels to the Gulf region under Operation Vantage in order to provide Kuwait with military protection and dissuade a potential conflict naval scimitars taking a frontline role aboard the carriers HMS Victorious and HMS Centaur and would have been used for strike missions against the advancing Iraqi forces had war truly broken out, the presence of the Royal Navy being able to deter a full invasion and conflict was avoided for the time being. While at the same time, scimitars were also prepared for a basic ground attack role using guns only in the Borneo confrontation, a series of small-scale jungle clashes in the border areas of Brunei and North Borneo from 1963 to 1966 fought between British Commonwealth forces and the armies of Indonesia, which resulted in victory for the British. Eventually, while the Scimitar did have some redeeming qualities, including being an airshow darling when squadrons of these fighters appeared at Farnborough to perform incredible displays, it soon became increasingly difficult for the aircraft to be used in the low-level attack role with what was a fairly basic navigation system, and in the face of the aircraft continuing to see multiple losses per year due to various accidents, the Navy relegated the type to second-line duties while the much more capable Blackburn Buccaneer was brought in to replace it. The underpowered Buccaneer Mark 1s, which couldn't operate from carriers with a full load of fuel, being supported by scimitars which had been converted into air-to-air -air refuelers, which would top up the tanks of the Buccaneers after takeoff prior to continuing on their missions. While other duties for scimitars in their last months of service included towing target banners, providing radar targets for calibration of ground-based radar sets, and a myriad of other menial tasks with the last frontline squadron, the original 803 squadron, withdrawing their units in October 1966, scimitars continuing in flight with the Fleet Requirements Unit until December 1970, after which the very last example, as well as the very last supermarine fighter, was retired. Today, the scimitar is often considered one of the worst frontline fighter aircraft ever to be put into service, and with its attrition rate of 51%, is among the most accident-prone single models in history, although despite its ruinous reputation, the Scimitar was more a victim of an unfocused development program, which changed its roles midway to completion, while further budgetary woes, which meant the Navy wasn't able to accommodate such large aircraft through expanding the dimensions of its carrier fleet, meant the resultant fighter was essentially doomed from the start, and is now remembered simply for being a dangerous killer 
that had only the distinction of being the last fighter built by Supermarine, a crushing end to the legacy of the same company that had built the mighty Spitfire.